Welcome to the Joseph Goldstein Insight Hour. This podcast is an expression of our shared interest in self-discovery. Join Joseph as he shares his deep knowledge of the path of mindfulness. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Joseph. So last week we began the discussion about mindfulness of the sense spheres. These are instructions the Buddha gave in the Satipatthana Sutta, in the fourth foundation of mindfulness, which is mindfulness of dhammas. We can understand what that means. It's often uh, hard to translate. Mindfulness of dhammas means here mindfulness of the categories of experience, or the categories of phenomena. So in this is included the hindrances, the aggregates, the sense spheres, the factors of enlightenment, the Four Noble Truths, all of that's included in this fourth foundation. <clears throat> so if you can remember those of you who were here last week, the beginning instruction in the sutta, which I'll repeat again. And again, imagine just that the Buddha is talking directly to us. These are instructions from the Buddha in how to practice. He said, monks, bhikkhus, which is all of us, in regard to dhammas, That is, in regard to these categories of experience, one abides contemplating these dhammas in terms of the six internal and external sense spheres. And how does one abide contemplating dhammas in terms of the six internal and external sense spheres? Here one knows the eye, one knows visible forms, and one knows the fetter that arises dependent on both. And the ear and sound, nose and smell, tongue and taste, body and sensations, and mind and mind objects, and the fetter that arises dependent on both. Okay, so we spent quite a bit of time last week discussing this first line of the instruction. Tonight I'd like to continue this exploration of mindfulness of the sense spheres in the last part of the instruction. So the Buddha goes on to say, one also knows how an unarisen fetter can arise, how an arisen fetter or defilement can be removed, and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. So here we're not simply knowing the fetters that arise at the different sense doors, in the different sense spheres. The Buddha is asking us to understand how they arise, how they can be removed, how they can be prevented. In other words, how we can free ourselves from the influence of these fetters, defilements, unwholesome tendencies of mind. Now this requires a careful looking, a careful mindfulness observation of this mind-body process. So we can begin to understand the causes and conditions behind the arising of the kalesas, the defilements. In some way, this is very analogous to all scientific research. Just, I think it was last week, there was an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine section about a lot of the advances in genetic research. And how through a more precise and exact understanding of the genetic process, the scientists and research doctors are able to develop 
much more precise and exact cures for diseases because the process of the arising of the disease is more carefully understood. Well, in a lot of the Buddhist texts, the Buddha is referred to as the great physician. Why? Because he understood with such exactitude and such precision the process by which suffering arises in our minds, in our lives. And he understood with such precision the possibilities for us to experience freedom. Now, the great gift of the Satipatthana Sutta and of all the teachings is that we don't have to figure all this out for ourselves. You know, as you undoubtedly have noticed, it's quite a challenge just to know an in-breath and an out-breath. Well, to see so precisely and carefully this very rapid process in the mind and how one thing conditions another without a map, without a guide, it would be extremely difficult for us to sort it all out. So this is the great gift of the teachings. In one well-known Buddhist chant where one chants the qualities of the Dhamma, the qualities that are honored are the fact that it can be experienced here and now. It's not postponed to some future time. That the Dhamma is timeless. It's as true now as it was in the Buddha's time. It has that quality of invitation. It's like not a question of belief. It's not that there's a dogma that we have to believe. Rather, it's an invitation for us to discover the truth of it for ourselves. It said that the Dharma is onward leading. It actually leads us to awakening, to freedom. And that it is to be practiced by the wise. So that's us. Okay, so what is this process? How do fetters arise? How can we remove those that have arisen and prevent the future arising? One of the most uh, direct teachings about this, of course, is in the very profound teaching of dependent origination. And this is sometimes referred to, this process of dependent origination is sometimes referred to as the arising or origin of the world. And in it, the Buddha describes the process that keeps the defilements arising, that keeps samsaric existence rolling along. I'll just read from one of the texts. It says, And what bhikkhus is the origin of the world? In dependence on the I, invisible forms, I consciousness arises. The meeting of these three, of I, visible forms, and consciousness, the meeting of these three is contact. With contact as condition, feeling comes to be. With feeling as condition, craving comes to be. With craving as condition, clinging. With clinging as condition, continued existence. With continued existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death. Sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection, and despair come to be. This because is the origin of the world. Okay, so how do we translate this teaching of dependent origination into something that's meaningful in our meditation practice and in our lives? 
it's so easy to re- to read this or to hear this and kind of have an intellectual perhaps appreciation of the logic of it but its transforming value is when we actually see these links for ourselves in our own experience that's the challenge for us we can understand the links in a very uh, on a very large scale the large cycle of birth and death and rebirth through all the realms of existence really describes how that happens but perhaps of more immediate applicability we can apply this teaching to the unfolding process within this life really see it moment to moment So there's an easy starting place. We're already born. Did anybody dispute that? Oh, we're here. So having taken birth, that already having happened, the sense spheres are a given. Right? Having taken birth. There's the eye and the ear and the nose and the tongue and the body and mind with their respective objects. Okay, so that's the foundation. That's the given. And this is why the Buddha has pulled out the contemplation of the sense spheres as a major object of contemplation in the Satipatthana Sutta. It's the foundation. Dependent or conditioned by the sense spheres contact happens because of the eye and visible objects seeing consciousness arises right the ear and sound hearing consciousness arises so contact is the conjunction of these three things contact means the coming together of the sense base the sense object and consciousness You with it? Now, this is pretty straightforward. Now, inevitably, when there's contact, feeling automatically arises. And feeling in this Buddhist Abhidhamma sense does not mean emotion, as we sometimes use the word in English. Feeling in this sense refers to what we can call the taste of an object the flavor of it that is whether it's pleasant whether it's unpleasant or neutral given the sense spheres this contact given contact this automatically feeling so just take a moment to really consider pick pick your favorite sense base and just take a moment to experience these three links so it's not just philosophy so you're actually translating it into what you're experiencing it could be the body in a sensation and then feeling it is either pleasant unpleasant neutral it could be the ear in sound pleasant unpleasant neutral and so just just for a moment reflect on one of those sense bases and the object and the contact and the feeling and right here is the critical juncture is a critical juncture because just at these links of sense fear contact and feeling the buddha is pointing to a door of awakening he's pointing to a way out of suffering as we have experienced many times in our meditation and in our lives when there is unwise attention to the moment of contact and feeling which are coming together 
when there's unwise attention in those moments of experience, then our conditioned reaction, our very automatic response to pleasant feeling is desire. We like it, we want it. Our conditioned response to unpleasant feeling is aversion. We don't want it, we don't like it. And our conditioned response to neutral feeling is often delusion, dullness. We don't know what's going on. So right there is the arising of the fetter. Right there is the arising of the defilement. When we're not paying careful attention or wise attention to these three links of sense, fear, contact, feeling. That's a very... Uh, liberating place to bring our to bring our attention to when we are mindful in those moments then we cut the chain of dependent origination right in the experience of the feeling the mindfulness of the feeling And it doesn't lead on to desire, to clinging, to becoming, to birth, to death. Right there, we have actually cut the chain of this samsaric conditioning. So the question for all of us is how do we put this into practice? You know, as I said, it's easy to appreciate the theory of it, but how can we apply it in a very practical and pragmatic way? We can be mindful of those first three links, sense, fear, contact, feeling, in a variety of ways. So, for example, we might notice just simply the different sense objects as they arise. Just to be mindful, oh, that's a sight, it's a visible form, that's a sound, that's a smell, that's a taste, that's a sensation, that's a thought. Just that simple recognition of the different six different sense objects, that's sufficient, it can be as simple as that. Being mindful moment after moment how the six sense objects are arising. We could notice the process of contact, which is where the knowing comes in. And so we might be mindful of the process of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting. And moment after moment in our experience, that's the noting or being mindful of the contact. Sense base, sense object, consciousness. And we're actually noticing. It's a moment of seeing, a moment of hearing, a moment of thinking. Again, it's not difficult. It's difficult to remember to do it. It's not difficult to actually do it. And so we just keep bringing our mind back to the simplicity of this. So sometimes we could choose to note the sense object. Sometimes we could choose to notice the contact, that is, the seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking. Sometimes we might emphasize simply the knowing aspect of all these experiences, you know, where we rest in the knowing. And here, there's a less effortful looking for the object, a less effortful directing the mind to the object, and it's a much more receptive awareness. We're simply settling back in the ease of knowing phenomena as they appear. And we're resting in the ease of that knowing. You know, when you hear a sound, does it require any special effort to know the sound? 
No, the knowing is right there. It's already there. And so we can practice both recognizing and resting in the ease of that knowing. As I mentioned last week, and I just as a, another reminder, there are only six things that ever happen in our lives. <laughs> There's only seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, bodily sensations, and mind objects. When we repeatedly are mindful or noticing, notice the arisings in this way, when we bring it right back down to being just one of these six things, which is always, this is what it always is. It always comes down to this then what that does, it takes us out of the complexity of our life stories. You know, we've created such an elaborate story about ourselves and our lives and our situation. And this way of being mindful just brings us right down to the immediate experience of just what it is that is actually happening. So it's powerful. It takes us out of the movie of our lives into a much more direct experience of the reality that's actually arising. Now, mindfulness, as you know, does not mean a cutting off of sense objects or sense impressions. And it doesn't mean an avoiding of them, because that would be impossible anyway. Mindfulness simply means being aware of what's arising, not trying to keep anything out. Okay, so we begin by either noting the the sense object, or we note the contact, or we note the feeling. If we're... or the knowing, if we are doing this and we see that a defilement is still arising, that we find we're still getting caught up in desire or aversion or fear or any one of them, the comparing, judging. If if we're doing this very simple practice, but we see that the mind is still getting caught in in these arising fetters, which it will. So then it's helpful to note or notice the feeling quality. And that's when we should particularly pay attention, oh, is this experience pleasant? Is it unpleasant? Is it neutral? Because that's what's conditioning the defilement. At one point in my practice, I was getting very lost in pleasant visual fantasies. Just, I would just be getting carried away by them. And at first I started noting seeing. Just seeing, every time, every time it arose. Seeing, seeing. But somehow that note and the noticing was not strong enough. It was, it was just too seductive. And I was getting pulled into it again and again. So then I started noting pleasant. Pleasant, pleasant, pleasant. That wasn't strong enough. Because I would know pleasant, oh, pleasant, pleasant. <laughs> you know, I could just feel myself kind of enjoying the pleasure of the pleasantness. But then remembering all of these links in the chain of dependent origination, I found a technique that worked very well. I started making a double note. I started noting contact, pleasant. And it was amazing. That was just like hitting the right point to unhook from attachment. Because in the note, or the noticing of contact, I was acknowledging the object that was arising. 
And in the note of pleasant, I was noticing the feeling. I was becoming mindful of the feeling rather than being identified with it or lost in it. And that double note, contact pleasant, was very effective. So I would suggest if you find yourself caught in some attachment, you know, some desire for an object, try working in that way. It could also be contact unpleasant. You know, if, if you're sitting and there's a lot of unpleasant physical sensation or unpleasant mind states, and you find yourself getting caught, that a fetter has arisen. Okay, how to remove the fetter? How to remove the defilement? By applying mindfulness of seeing this chain of dependent origination, seeing how it's arisen. Contact unpleasant. By becoming mindful of it, there's the possibility of the mind letting go. Okay, it all seems so simple. Be mindful of the sense spheres, be mindful of contact, be mindful of feeling, and come to the end of suffering. But, (laughs) but, big but, we all know that there are some very long, deeply established habits of mind tendencies of mind which often speed us right by these various doorways to freedom and doorways to unhooking we speed right by the contact we speed right by the feeling and we often find ourselves in the midst of desire because we haven't picked up those earlier links but The beauty of this teaching is that when we understand the next links in the chain, we have some more opportunities for freeing our mind from entanglement. These are the backup possibilities in case we miss the first three. So in this situation, if we find ourselves not having been mindful of the sense fear, the sense object, or the contact, or the feeling state, which, you know, is very quick, it's just in a moment. We can become aware, we can become mindful, bring mindfulness to bear on the desire itself. So that becomes what we're looking at. Now this part of the practice is tremendously illuminating. Because desire is one of the basic primal forces driving our life, driving the life process. This is not an insignificant little piece of our experience. The energy of desire is a primal force, right, which basically is driving samsara. So whenever we have an opportunity to observe it, to investigate this force in our mind, it's a very profound undertaking, you know, and we can really take a tremendous interest in it, in understanding it. In Pali, the word is tanha, and it's been translated in different ways, often as desire or craving or thirst, or a hungering. You know, it's that, it's, that, it's that energy in the mind of wanting. And the importance of understanding what this energy of tanha, of craving, of wanting, of thirsting for things, its, important is high, its importance is highlighted in the very uh, first words that the Buddha is said to have either thought or or uttered after his enlightenment, his his song of enlightenment, you know, the, the last lines of the verse just after his awakening under the Bodhi tree were attained 
is the unconditioned, attained is the deathless, achieved is the end of craving. So this is a very clear, direct statement of the nature of the liberated mind. Achieved is the end of craving. Now we may not yet quite be at the point of proclaiming this for ourselves. But we can begin to understand just how desire is working in the mind, understanding it more clearly, and experiencing the freedom of its ending, even if it's just for a few moments at a time. Now, we can get a taste of liberation every time, even if it's just for a few moments, we see the end of craving, the end of desire. So there's something powerful to see in our practice in this regard. Okay, so how can we experiment with working with this link in the chain of dependent origination, both seeing it's arising out of the feeling, pleasant or unpleasant, and how can we see the ending of it? So just as an experiment, notice, practice noticing when just some very simple desires arise in the mind. You know, start with, start with little things. Maybe there's a desire for a cup of tea or a desire for a piece of chocolate or a desire to take a nap. You know, maybe it's a desire projecting into the future to meet your friends or partner after the retreat. You know, a desire for the next vacation. Just some, just some very kind of simple, straightforward desire. See if you can notice when it arises. Not getting lost in it, not pushing it away. You might feel the energy of it, not only to recognize that the desire is there, but it's almost dropping down and feeling what the energy of wanting is like. What does it feel like? Right? This quality of wanting. Now, at some point, just in being mindful of this very simple desire that's arisen, you may notice that it disappears. It's there, it's there, it's there, but it's not there forever. You know, at a certain point, it will pass away. Highlight that moment. Really pay attention to that moment of transition. When you've noticed the desire, you've noticed the wanting, and then at whatever point, however long it lasts, notice the experience of the mind when it disappears. That's a very important moment for a couple of reasons. It's important because it actually gives us an experiential sense of the ease or freedom of the end of craving, the end of wanting. We've gone from the desire to non-desire. And we can feel the ease of it. It's like being let out of the grip of something. So it's important for us to get that taste of freedom. And it's also important, that particular moment of transition, because it reinforces our understanding and direct experience of the impermanence of desire. We see that it does not always have to be fulfilled in order to be resolved, because it's impermanent. It's there for some time, and then it's not. Of course, we can do this. The desire may arise, and we're with it, with it, with it, and then it's gone, and we notice that moment that it's gone. But many times, a few moments later, it comes right back. You know, we see that very same desire or a different one reappearing sometimes even stronger than before. I get, a, I get a kind of 
perverse delight in watching my mind, particularly at these times, this sequence, and particularly when this des- a desire arises, and I see it, and I have kind of a strong resolve, I'm not going to act on that. Right? So I have a certain determination of renunciation. So I'm watching this desire, and you know it'll disappear the first time and maybe come back. It comes up again, disappear, maybe it'll come back. And after a while, it's almost as if this desire is just lurking, <laughs> you know, waiting for a moment of unwise attention. And all of a sudden, the teacup is in my hand. <laughs> so this leads us to the next link in the chain, when that's the situation, right? When we've watched the desire and we've watched it come and go, and we've learned from it, but then it just sneaks back up and it grabs us, and there's another link. There's one more chance we have, and that is the link between desire and clinging. So at this point, things are getting serious, (laughs) because... It's in noticing clinging, this is our last chance to free ourselves from the sequence before we act. Right? If we miss the clinging, that's going to condition some action or other. But it's a very interesting juncture, this juncture between desire and clinging. You know, very often when we're not really paying that careful attention, it all gets lumped together, a wanting and clinging and attachment. But the Buddha separated them out, you know, in this teaching of dependent origination. Right? There's the sense sphere, there's contact, there's feeling. When we're not mindful, it leads to desire or craving. When we're not mindful of that, then it results or conditions clinging. Now, clinging means the holding on to. The desire or craving is just the wanting. Clinging is the holding on to or the grasping at either the object of our desire or the desire itself. We can cling to the desire. And I've noticed this a lot in my mind. In watching this sequence, I find that I'm often less entranced by the actual object, and I'm more attached to the desire for it. Do you see the difference? And it's all of this is, as I've said before, all of this is an invitation for you to look into your own minds, you know, and to see all of these things. And then I look to see, well, why am I holding on to the thought, to the desire thought, when I don't even care so much, you know, about the cup of tea or whatever it is. And when I look carefully, I often see that the clinging to the desire often comes or is born out of a fear of the feeling of deprivation, right? There's some kind of avoidance in my mind of having that feeling of being deprived arise. And so that's what's keeping me attached to the desire. And there are a whole series of thoughts that come you know, and after a while, it becomes a little humorous. Why not? I mean, there's nothing wrong with a cup of tea. Why not just have it? I'll feel more energy. If I have this piece of chocolate, and then I'm going to really be able to practice. Be good to yourself. <laughs> So the mind can rationalize in so many ways what really is the force of clinging in the mind. 
So it's not to say that there's anything particularly wrong with a cup of tea. Right? All of the, I mention all of this just as a way of kind of prompting an investigation for how these links condition our mind, condition our actions, condition our lives. Because these examples have been small ones. But it's also working in very big ways. You know, in big movements of mind that have serious effects. Okay, so working in all of these ways, working on the level of contact, on the level first of the sense sphere, just the sense objects as they arise, then the contact of the seeing, hearing, smelling being mindful of the feeling. You know, when we find ourselves reactive, then actually noticing pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. If we find ourselves in the middle of desire, paying attention to how that's happening. If we move to clinging, I'd really take a look at that and see what's conditioning this grasping. All of this is putting into practice the Buddha's instruction One knows how an unarisen fetter can arise, how an arisen fetter can be removed, and how a future arising of the removed fetter can be prevented. And so these are the ways we actually apply this teaching. Why all this emphasis on seeing how fetters arise, removing them when they're arisen, preventing them. Saira Upandita, when he was here teaching, he said one thing that very much lodged in my mind. It is a very powerful teaching for me. He said, 100% of our suffering is due to defilements in the mind. One hundred percent. If we're suffering, it's because there's some defilement in the mind. Well, that's a powerful... For me, that was a very powerful kind of wake-up. Because it's so easy in different circumstances to put the blame for our suffering on external conditions, external causes. And it's not to say that there aren't things which cause difficulty. But if we're suffering around that difficulty, it's because of one or another of the kalesis. So really coming to the end of suffering means that we learn how to work with and understand and free ourselves from the force of these fetters in the mind. And what's amazing about this teaching is it's ultimately completely empowering. Because it's all up to us. It's not, our suffering is not due to other people. We can take responsibility for our own minds. So this is tremendously uh, empowering you know, in our lives. In the book by Venerable Analayo, which is called Satipatthana, The Direct Path to Realization, which is a wonderful book about the Satipatthana Sutta, and it's actually the book that inspired this whole series of talks. In addition to these links of dependent origination, he also pointed out part of the Buddha's teachings, which describes another progression that also entangles us with the fetters, with the defilements, And so it's another progression that's very helpful uh, to understand.
in this sequence, we start again with the sense spheres and contact and feeling, but then instead of going the route of desire, clinging, you know, becoming, the Buddha talks of how this contact, this feeling, and along with feeling is perception. And it's perception which leads to thought and what in Pali is called papancha, or the mental proliferation, conceptual proliferation, which we are all familiar with. You know, how the mind just starts thinking about something and then the thoughts proliferate, and then we're lost in that proliferation. So it's helpful here to look at how this is working because it's so instructive for how our lives are unfolding. So what is perception? Perception is the mental factor which interprets experience. It interprets experience by recognizing and remembering the distinguishing marks. So on the simplest level, it recognizes the difference between red and blue, between hot and cold, between man and woman. It's it's perception which is interpreting the sense data. And it picks out what distinguishes one thing from another, and then it remembers that with a concept. There's one understanding that can arise right here that is essential for our liberation. It's really a key point of understanding. And that is that the perceptions we have of the world, moment to moment, of our experience, the perceptions we have are not absolutes. They are con- our perceptions are conditioned, and they're conditioned on many different levels. One of the great misconceptions that many of us carry through our lives is that our perceptions of ourselves and of the world are basically accurate and true. I mean, don't we, don't we think that? We think that the way we perceive things, mostly, is an accurate and true representation of how things actually are. This misconception that our perceptions reflect some ultimate or stable reality is the cause of tremendous suffering, both globally and also personally, in our own life situations. So I'll mention just a few examples of the conditioned nature of our perceptions. On one level, the way we perceive things is conditioned by our karmic predispositions. So, what a vulture might see as a delectable meal, we would probably see as repulsive, rotting flesh. Same object, different perceptions, based on the vulture's karma, having taken rebirth as a vulture, and our karma, having taken rebirth as a human being. That conditions the way we perceive things. There are cultural conditions Think of all of the violence in the Middle East now. From one set of cultural values, the suicide bombers are violent terrorists, causing a huge amount of suffering and destruction. From another set of cultural values, they are perceived as holy martyrs, you know, for, for a noble cause. It's very rare 
in the midst especially of intense situations, for people to remember that the way we perceive things is conditioned. Conditioned by a particular background, by a particular set of circumstances. We can see the bias of our perceptions in more ordinary circumstances. And this had this very powerfully come to light. This happened several years ago, and there was kind of a big organizational conflict going on. And I was right in the middle of it, and we were at a, we were at a board meeting. And there were a lot of intense views. And I just kept thinking, I am seeing this so clearly. <laughs> and why can't other people understand this? You know, and feelings were running very high. A lot of, a lot of uh, strong emotion, a lot of defensiveness, a lot of anger. At a certain point, you know, when I was feeling my own suffering in this in this intense situation, in this conflict, and also just the suffering that I felt in the room, at a certain point it's like woke up a little bit and I stepped back and I asked a very liberating question of myself. I said, why are other people feeling the way they're feeling? Right? How are they perceiving the situation that gives rise to their point of view? And just by doing that, just by acknowledging, yeah, this is a situation, and we are perceiving it in different ways, based on different assumptions and different understandings. As soon as I could do that, I became much less caught in all the judgments in my mind and all the uh, strong emotions in my mind, became much easier to understand other people's points of view. Oh, that's why they feel this way. Because they're perceiving it you know, in a particular way. At different times I've mentioned this teaching of the Zen master Bankai. He was a 17th century Japanese Zen master. Wrote a wonderful book called The Unborn. And one of the lines in this book where he says, don't side with yourself. And that's really all about this understanding that our perceptions are conditioned. They are not reflective of some omniscient absolute truth. Obviously, this does not mean that we simply let go of all our viewpoints about things. But rather, if we're not so attached to them, then we can step back, see things from different points of view, and assess in a much more open, easy way, well, what is the wisest course of action to take? So it just opens the mind a little bit. I'm about halfway through, but I think we'll (laughs) continue next week. (laughs) But I just want to mention one last kind of way perceptions are conditioned. And these, they're conditioned by the latent tendencies in our mind. You know, that, that the habitual projections that color how we view ourselves and how we view the world. So one common example of this, how the latent tendencies in our mind color our perceptions, it's how we view our meditation. You come in and you have a sitting and the body feels light and easy and good concentration. 
oh, that was a good sitting. You come in and you sit, and there's a lot of discomfort in the body, and maybe there's restlessness or different hindrances. Oh, that was really a bad sitting. We don't even think of evaluating it in terms of how mindful we were. It's on a pleasant, good sitting, unpleasant, bad sitting. We're perceiving the quality of our meditation conditioned by the latent tendencies in the mind of greed and aversion. We like what's pleasant, we don't like what's unpleasant. And so we start perceiving the world through that filter. So we do this in many, many situations. We want to begin waking up to this. Now what makes this understanding so powerful, and which we'll talk about more next week, is the recognition that because our perceptions are conditioned, when we really recognize this and see this, the condition by our mental habits, what this means is that we can train our perceptions. We can train ourselves to perceive things in a way that supports happiness and supports freedom. We don't have to be caught right, in ways of perceiving that keep us mired in suffering. And this is this is the great power of understanding the process of our minds, the process of how things are unfolding. It really gives us the possibility of awakening, awakening to greater levels of happiness, greater levels of freedom. So I'll just close with the Buddha's last words. Okay, realize the import of this. You're the Buddha, fully enlightened being, spent 45 years of his life wandering all over northern India, teaching people. His whole life was dedicated you know, to the awakening of beings. These are his last words. So I think it's good to take them in. They're, they're of import. With the light of perfect wisdom, dispel the darkness of ignorance. Subject to decay are all conditioned things. Awaken through heedfulness. This is a powerful teaching. Subject to decay are all conditioned things. Awaken through heedfulness. And so all of these instructions in the Satipatthana Sutta are about how to do this. <laughs> 